It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for coming. My name is Matt Hurst, and I am Senior Director of OD Talent and Learning for the GameStop family of brands. We're going to spend about 20 minutes together discussing the value of leading an inventive and imaginative learning culture, which is often difficult for most of us because from the time that we're young, as children, we are, in fact, very creative. But starting at about the time that we go into kindergarten, that creativity is, is tamped down. Our teachers are starting to encourage us to color between the lines, conform, and comply. And as we get older and we grow up and we become adults and start to have careers and, and create leadership roles within an organization, we basically feel like we've got to stay within our own lane, do what's expected of us, do it well, and not be too inventive or creative. I think that there's great power in mastering two particular skills. The first is understanding how to imagine like a child, and the second is knowing how to think like an adult. And as we grow in our careers, we actually become very good at learning to think like adults. We learn to operationalize and monetize the parts of our business, but we often lose sight of our ability to imagine like a child, that's the creative, inventive thinking that will be so important to you and your organization. So I encourage all learning and development professionals to become the mad scientists of their organization. And this presentation and discussion is about learning to become the mad scientist in your organization. Albert Einstein once said that we cannot solve our problems by using the same kind of thinking that we used when we created them. But in fact, in our organizations, that's very often what we try to do. We fail in our abilities to define the problem clearly and effectively and completely. And then when we do, we employ the same type of historical thinking that got us into the situation that we now face and we need to overcome. And so, as a GameStop leader, I feel compelled to turn to a gaming expert for some advice and guidance in this area. I also hold the view that if you're going to use somebody else's content, what I'll loosely describe as professional plagiarism and ethical plagiarism, please always turn to the best. And Jane McGonigal is one of the biggest, brightest thinkers in terms of the thinking related to the power of gaming and its ability to, to encourage and influence creative thinking. So Jane McGonigal is a research scientist in Germany and she's done a lot of studies related to how gaming affects us. And she has said that when we play games, we're constantly experiencing a sense of agency. Every turn that we take and every move that we make changes the state of the game, much like the decisions that we make organizationally, whether that decision is risk tolerant and creative, or is risk averse and non-creative. And that is why playing games can be such an empowering experience for folks. Computer and video games instill players with the sense that they can influence outcomes because when you play a video game, with every choice that you make within the game, you are affecting the rest of the game. So by making a specific decision, creative or otherwise, or, or risk averse or risk tolerant, you're heading down a different path in the game. Likewise, when you make decisions within your organization, you are doing exactly the same. As a result of that sense of agency, gamers feel more assertive, they feel more hopeful, and they feel more empowered to realize change, thereby creating a better sense of risk tolerance and the ability to take the risks required for creative thinking. Honing a trio of skills can help you strengthen that sense of creative agency in the real world. And we're gonna take a look at those right now. The first one is called counterfactual memory, and that is predicting the past by visualizing an alternative course your life might have taken had you made different choices. The second one that I'll ask you to practice at some point during this video or following this video is called counterfactual foresight. And that is remembering the future by imagining an event or outcome that you have never experienced. 
that happens. So what you're doing in that particular situation is envisioning something that's important to you and your organization. And with counterfactual foresight, you are recalling that particular event as though it had already happened. And the third one is hard empathy, where you picture yourself walking in someone else's shoes. And we all deal with empathy quite a lot in our organizations. So we won't talk much about that. But it is important to understand what these cognitive exercises will do for you, your team, and your organization. The first is they balance discouragement with empowerment. Choices matter, and when you know that choices matter, you feel more empowered to make the choices that will matter most to you and to your organization. You have far more control over your life's and organization's future than you might think you do. Your team and your organization can be far more imaginative and creative than you currently think it can be. They also stimulate the brain neurons responsible for creative problem solving, which encourages a yet unseen vision of the future. There are four physical exercises that I'm going to ask you to complete to help introduce and expand some of those ideas. And if you're with someone right now as you're watching this video, I would encourage you to do it with those folks. If you are not with someone as you watch this video, I would encourage you to do this with others when you have the chance. So the first activity is I'm going to ask that you stand and assume some sort of power pose. That could be hands on your hips. It could be the bicep flex. It could be something that suggests physical confidence and prowess. And I want you to have some fun with it. Please assume as many of those different poses as you can if you're with other people and have some fun doing it. If you're watching this alone, please do it after the fact. The second exercise you will also do with other folks, other people, and I would ask that about half of the group that you're with, click your fingers 100 times. So focus on one, two, three, four, all the way to 100. Ask the other folks in the room to shout out numbers between 1 and 100 as you continue to try to focus on what you're doing. In the third activity, please pull out your phone or your iPad or something else that has an image emotionally important to you. So most of us have a background image of our, of our spouse, partner, children, dogs, something and someone really important to you. And I would ask that you turn to other people in the room and talk about that picture and what that photo means for you and why it's important for you. And the final exercise is I'm going to ask that you take the hand of the person in the room with you now or later and shake that person's hand firmly and enthusiastically for a period of not less than 10 seconds. You will find that that feels excruciatingly long, but it's important that you do this for the full 10 seconds. Now, that begs the question, why these four particular activities? They are fun. I think you will have a good time doing them. But they also represent four things really important to you as you build your own creative and imaginative thinking. The first one, the power pose, reminds you that what you need to be creative is confidence. And as you think about the, the pose, the physical prowess, you're reminding yourself that you are a lot more powerful and confident and influential than you might think you are. The second element reminds you to focus on the things that matter most to you and to your organization. Because in our era, there are so many distractions that can keep you away from the things that are most important to you your business, your organization, and the people in the organization. So to think deeply and creatively, you may have to figure out ways to turn off the notifications, push the iPad to the side, rent a conference room or reserve a conference room where you can do some deep, thoughtful, creative thinking. 
and avoid the distractions that will really get in the way of the creative thinking. The third reminds you that for every creative endeavor and every successful endeavor that you undertake, you need an emotional connection. It has to be something for which you feel great passion and something that you want to pursue because it's meaningful for you. And the picture that you shared with others and they shared with you will remind you of how powerful such an emotional connection really is. And then the final exercise reminds you that for every successful undertaking, you need a relational connection. And that is someone with whom you can partner successfully as you begin to conceive and deliver some of your ideas. If you're with other folks right now, I would ask that you engage in an activity for about 10 or 15 minutes, either now with the folks that you're with or folks that you engage in after this video. But this is the counterfactual foresight that I talked about earlier, and it's described as I remember when, and it works like this. With counterfactual foresight, you are remembering something that has not yet happened. So you are envisioning an idea that needs to happen, something that you want to bring to life, as though it had already happened. I remember when we launched our full organization level LMS. Or as another illustration, I remember when I was invited or members of my team were invited to all senior leadership meetings to help map the talent strategy of our organization. The people that you're with are going to challenge your idea and ask you probing questions such as, how did you do that? How did you pay for it? How did you get senior leaders to approve of it? And they're really poking holes, not at the idea, but challenging you to think creatively about how you got that idea done, even though that idea has not come to life. Once again, you are remembering something that you want to do as though it had already happened and other folks are asking questions about that. I would encourage you to take about 15 minutes or so to work through that exercise so everyone participating in the exercise can do the same thing. So what does it mean? The reason that you do the exercise is that there are three things that happen when you undertake this exercise. The, the, th the three things that you need to be most successful with any creative or strategic endeavor emerge from that exercise. The first is you need a big, bold, creative idea. And you already have those. The reasons that you are not leveraging those or delivering those is because you're feeling the constraints of the organization bearing down on you and you feel that you cannot get them done. The second is that you need some sort of plan to get those ideas off the ground. And then the third is that you need a partner to get those ideas off the ground. So whether you choose to devote 10 minutes to this exercise, 15 minutes to this exercise, or longer, you are delivering three things. By the time you emerge from this exercise, you will have had and delivered an idea, which was big, bold, and creative. You would have started to create some sort of plan because people will have asked you questions such as, how did you get this done? And you will have connected with someone else in the discussion who is committed to helping you get that done. So my question for all of you is if you only need three things to be successful, ideas, plans, and people, my question of you is what is holding you back? In the mere 10 to 15 minutes that you might have devoted to this exercise, you have achieved parts of all three. Now, were it that simple, we would all be doing that. There are some things that need to happen prior to that before you can become the mad scientist of your organization, and that's building creative trust. And there are four things that I think are critical and critically important to learning and development professionals to build the type of creative trust in their organization that will allow them to be imaginative and creative. The first is working in the business, being in the front lines of the business and understanding what happens between the customer and the business and how you can make it better. And that's really going into the units of your business, asking questions. And I would recommend that you try to achieve two things in that endeavor. The first is be a student of the business and the second to be a servant of the business. 
The second is working on the business and it's understanding what's really important to the business and how you make money. Because if you don't understand the financial drivers of the business, it's hard to create a lot of imaginative energy about moving the organization forward financially if you don't understand how the organization makes money. Working with people is precisely what you think it is, and that's building lasting, trusting relationships with other people. And the fourth one is working on people, something for which you already excel as either a business or a learning and development professional. It's about bringing out the best in the organization and in the people in the organization. Let's bring it home with a couple concluding ideas. One day consists of 86,400 seconds, each one containing countless options, possibilities, and decisions of which only one can emerge. Eighty-six thousand four hundred seconds. This is one of them. One week consists of six hundred and four thousand eight hundred seconds. One month, 2,629,746 seconds. One year, 31,556,926 seconds. One lifetime. 2,366,820,000 seconds. Each one containing countless options, possibilities, and decisions, of which only one can emerge. Each with the ability to create one life and erase another. One day consists of 86,400 seconds. This is one of them. Thank you.